There is a rule in journalism that if you ask a question in the headline, the answer is no. Uh, that rule was made by very boring old men who thought that journalism should be the voice of God, generally theirs, and not a conversation about topics. They wanted to give you answers, but quite clearly, life is full of questions. This is the last knot. My dad told me to say this. That said, England is probably not sneaky good at tests now. I mean, at the very least, caveats abound in their last two tests, and nothing else can erase what happened before. This is two matches at home, and while it is nominally against the World Test Champion, you'd have to argue that whoever this New Zealand team is, they aren't quite the Kiwis of a year ago. This new New Zealand is kind of shit. They battled in India, then drew with Bangladesh and South Africa at home. And considering they built their modern legacy on being good in New Zealand, that's fairly awful. And they had the kind of summer I survived years ago, where I had to drive across town to work at an archaic, dangerous factory full of huntsman spiders that was run by a cult. Sadly, that's all true. For New Zealand, this English summer hasn't been much better. One big difference in the series doesn't really seem to be talent, but COVID. New Zealand are testing for it, and Ben Stokes basically said, you don't have it if you don't test. Looking at the two nations, this seems to correlate fairly well with how both of them actually handled the pandemic. But for New Zealand, it meant that Henry Nichols didn't play in the first test, and in the second, Kane Williamson didn't play. And it's not just about the global lurgy. New Zealand have lost a bowler mid-test twice. Now, they do have five men attacks, so losing a player to them is not quite as important, but conditions were favoring Colin de Grandhomme at Lords, and they certainly could have used Kyle Jameson at Trent Bridge. Hell, they could have used anyone in big boy pants at Nottingham. And that's not even including the baffling bowling selections that they have chosen so far in the series. Ajaz over Henry at Lords, and Henry over Wagner at Trent Bridge. Plus, they also somehow lost after scoring 500 runs, which was helped by one of the most confused third inning setting of a total you will ever see. Special shout out to their two runouts there as well. So New Zealand hasn't been good, whole, or even washing their hands as vigorously as they should be. And so all that does play into England being better. And even so, England haven't bossed these games. I lost count of how many times they tried to give it back to New Zealand at Lords. Their bowling at the start of the Trent Bitch match was absolutely terrible. And if the Kiwis haven't kept giving away early wickets, they probably would have scored 700. And there's two obvious ways to look at their chases, which are the fifth and 11th highest in English test history. Either you respect their twin five wicket wins, or you wonder how suddenly they all managed about like fourth innings Gordon Greenwich who is probably the best fourth innings batter of all time. There is clearly an element of fluke in two chases like this happening so close together. A lot of things have to go right. You have to be chasing twice to begin with. But England were a dumpster fire of diuretic baby nappies and weak old taco meat coming into this series. And suddenly they won two tricky chases against an excellent team on paper. So let's look at the reasons why this is all happening. England drinks to Brendan McCullum Kool-Aid with similar gusto to how the great man attacked a power play. Even in New Zealand, they're like, yeah, he was great, but it was a team thing. Let's just bring it down a little. In England, they fell hard for Baz and they gave him the red ball job even when they wanted him for the white ball job. And so it is possible with their utmost respect for the great man, they have somehow just been fixed, inspired, or he's found a way to connect with them just in a heartbeat. However, McCullum hasn't had this kind of impact at franchise level. If he's had any effect on England other than telling the guys how great they are, it's probably in that kind of new coach bounce. When a team changes leader and there is a surge, we just assume it's the new coach. But it's likely just a normal part of fluctuation of test cricket, or a regression back to the mean, or the fact they were sucking so hard under the other coach they could only really get better. And you could make all the same comments about Ben Stokes in either direction. Perhaps him bowling when he said he wouldn't, and his weird couple of innings inspired England. Or maybe just the fact that Ben Stokes is actually making some runs after a full year where he didn't do that, and bowling pretty well as well, is the boost they needed. I know Roots hundreds aren't a big thing, they happen a lot now. But when he does make back-to-back -back hundreds, even when England were a terrible side, they still looked, you know, much better. So when you add a couple of guys chipping in around him, at the very least there is an illusion of a batting order. To be fair, Pope did a lot more than chip in. He found the form he hinted at in South Africa, but of course since then, it's been nothing like that. 
And so this was lovely for him. I still don't think he'll ever be a bankable number three, he just doesn't seem to be that kind of player. But that was an important knock for him and for England. I mean, even Root can't chase 500 on his own, although probably try at the moment. And if Pope has recovered something, what about Lees? It was actually hard not to run out on the ground and check his pulse when he was playing in the West Indies. He was born an attacking player, turned himself into the stodgiest of stodgy plotters, got picked for England, managed to find new ways to score even slower, and then in Nottingham, he smashes England's first 30 runs. Is that McCallum, Stokes, or something else? But Lee certainly looks like a completely different player than he did a month ago. And you have to talk about form here. Last year, the second most runs by an English player was Rory Burns with 530. Bear Stoke already has more. Stokes is almost there as well. Even Folks has been making runs in this series, or at the least, being not out and looking good. Crawley probably had one innings where he looked okay, but maybe isn't in the form of some of the others. But considering everyone was out of form, having one player who's not making runs is still much better. England has finally found a bunch of batters actually hitting the ball at the same time. And sometimes, that's all you need. Let's, let's try and go through this as carefully as we can. England's two best bowlers right now are probably Joffre Archer and Jimmy Anderson, all things considered skill, experience, age, blah, blah, blah. Just behind them is Ollie Robinson and Stuart Broad. Chris Wokes probably not quite on that level, but not far away. And you would have Mark Wood at a similar level as well. Although you might put him higher if Archer's not available. Ollie Stone and Saka Mahmood are probably here based on Stone's reputation and what Mahmood did in the West Indies. And over here we have Craig Overton and Sam Curran, who, to be honest, I, I have no idea where they actually fit on this depth chart. And then a couple of places back, it's Matthew Fisher and Matty Potts. Before Potts was bowling at Lords, he was probably somewhere around, what, ninth on their depth chart? And then he comes in and he tears down the house in the first step. And just as it looked like he was struggling in the second one, he bowls a ripper spell. I'm not sure anyone really doubted England's fast medium reserves. But even within that, this was a hell of a bonus when your ninth best bowler can come in and do that. That's even, he's even lower down the food chain than Scott Boland was. When you have this many injuries and a spinner who can't take wickets, it's huge to have your ninth best seamer come in and just do a very good job. And on seamers, let's talk about Broad and Anderson. And let's not talk about whether they can continue to tour because, you know, I've done that before, right? Like in an old, like I made a whole video about it. But at home, where England also struggled at recent times, they're still pretty good, but they obviously have some flaws. Their combination is not perfect these days. Perhaps though, if you drop Joffre Archer on that, it won't matter. But at the moment, it's quite clear that picking them is still better if you want to win than not picking them. And as much as Stokes and McCullum could have given England a boost, this just did it better. Who knew that picking two bowlers with this many wickets was a good idea when trying to win test matches? So there you have it. A lot of things have gone right for England to win the last two test matches. And I don't think we really have any idea if they're actually good or this is just two matches. Some of this is form, theirs and New Zealand's. Some of this is small sample size. It is only two tests. Some of this is simple regression to the mean. Oli Pope, for instance, couldn't continue to be that bad. And some of this is COVID testing. But if you're an English fan right now and you lived through the last couple of years, it probably doesn't matter to you if this is real or not. It just matters that they didn't suck and they didn't suck in an entertaining and fun and winning way.